And he's like progressively getting more and more angry. And he's like, that was so disrespectful. That shows me your character, that you're not a responsible person, that you're not going to take care of my daughter. I don't like Whoa. this. I don't like you for my family. And my family, this is unacceptable. He pulled over and said, get out of my car. And he kicked me out of his car. And he left me on the side of the highway and he drove off. I'm Louis Cole. Welcome to the Recharged Podcast. In this series, I invite fellow content creators and artists to explore exciting ways to make a difference in the world. I take my guests to visit local social good projects in my self-converted electric 1973 Volkswagen van. We have real and raw conversations about life and hear from social good heroes that we can all be inspired by. On today's podcast, our guest is Jason Y. Lee, an accomplished producer and director, successful entrepreneur and founder of Jubilee Media, a digital agency, social enterprise and movement of young changemakers, which now has a social following of over 8 million. Jubilee's tagline is feel more, think more, see more in others. Their goal is creating a movement of empathy and connection. Jason believes we are all intrinsically linked and want to live for something deeper. Living for empathy and human good is a resilient vision and one that is worthy of pursuit. So today's guest is Jason and I'm just so excited to have you, Thank you on the likewise. podcast, bro. I'm, I'm so happy to not only see you because it's been ages, it feels it like been a while. COVID, but also to see this beauty, yeah. which I've been watching your journey and Dude, I'm just in awe that we're in a moving vehicle that you essentially built. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. I mean, technically <laughs> I didn't build it, but it feels like I built it, which I, is exciting. Hey, I like barely know how to change my oil, so I, I feel like you're like leaps and bounds ahead of me. <laughs> uh, but kudos. So to kick off, what I've been doing is just asking guests to do like a three minute life story. Okay. Just to, just to start us off. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, so my name is Jason Wiley. I'm the founder of the CEO of Jubilee Media. My story kind of begins in Kansas. Uh, I was raised in Kansas, but my parents are uh, professors, which is why we ended up there. Uh, but my entire life, I was kind of like followed the rules. I like, you know, the dream was study hard, get into a good college, get a good job, you know, have a successful career, like have family, retire, that's happiness. And that's kind of like the journey I went on for like the first 21 years of my life. I ended up going to Penn, studying business at Wharton, uh, graduated, went to go work at a consulting firm called Bain in New York. And I was like, I've made it. This is the dream. And as I was looking around, I, re I realized, wait a second. It wasn't that I was unhappy. I wasn't like completely fulfilled. It wasn't, I, I didn't feel the happiness that I thought. And I was around then that I started to realize, wait a second, what if I'm supposed to do something completely different with my life. What if I were not afraid, what is it that I would be doing? And it was around then that I actually start, first started making YouTube videos. Um, and my first video was because of the Haiti earthquake to raise money. So I went, raised money, made a video about it, you know, 10,000 views, raised thousands of dollars. And I was like, oh, I went viral. And then that became my journey of like making short stories, short videos on YouTube for a good cause. I eventually started a nonprofit called the Jubilee Project. And then in 2017, I launched Jubilee Media. And our whole purpose is that we want to create a media company that really kind of bridges people together and really inspires empathy in a time that we feel like we are so divided and that people don't really take time to listen to each other and understand each other. So that's my story. You both your parents are South Korean, right? Yep. Korean um, immigrants. But they yeah. like first generation immigrants. They immigrated, yep, exactly. And from what I understand, there's an even add like a higher added pressure and expectation in that culture. Yeah. So I think I watched one of the interviews you had and it was like having to break that news to your mom was like oh, it was so big for her and like dramatic, yeah. <laughs> what I'm just so intrigued to with with such knowing there'd be such a kind of backlash or n not an immediate acceptance what was it that was like really driving you to be like no I still need to do this yeah I mean the thing about immigrants you know my parents were immigrants from Korea they immigrated to America maybe in 1985 and for them the journey was like so perilous right they had no money and they were like how we have a dream and we believe that America is gonna be this great place for not only ourselves but our kids one day um, but they had to struggle so much to get to where they are. And that's why they had very much this mindset as they were growing up here, or uh, not growing up, as they were making a life here, of, oh, it seems like the stable jobs are in, you know, law or being a doctor or 
or being an engineer, these are jobs that will always be there. And that's why I think that they pushed me and my brother into those spaces because they thought, oh, surely if they're in this space, it's going to be less struggle. And that's what we want from our, for our kids. And it's interesting because they came here for a dream. In a lot of ways, they're like forcing us into their dream of what we should do now. But in a lot of ways, I never really asked myself what my dream was. But um, I think what, what really helped me, you know, I'm sure you get this all the time. We get, we get asked sometimes to speak at different events, right? And speak at colleges, the young people. And I remember hearing a speaker that went right before me and she was talking about a palliative care nurse named Bonnie, Bonnie Ware. Um, are you, like a palliative care nurse is like a type of nurse that is like helping folks who are gonna pass away soon actually. So helping their kind of like w their transition. And for all these folks who are about to die, she would ask them a really important question. She said, what is your biggest regret in your life? And you know, folks would say, you know, I wish I had traveled more or I wish I spent more time with my family. But the majority of the people who are about to die would say, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not one that others expected of me. And when I heard that, I like literally just felt like it cut me to the heart because I felt like that was speaking exactly to me. That I had been someone who had listened to what my parents had told me and what society had told me was successful. And I never asked myself if I were not afraid, if I were really to listen to who I am supposed to be, how would I live my life? And that didn't get me from zero to the top of Mount Everest, but it did encourage me to take that very first step to make that very first video. You know, and even so, it's like this very long, I don't want people to listen to this and be like, oh, now I gotta quit my job because it's not that easy. Yeah. But it kind of helped me to like explore different things and say yes more and start to find what it is that I was really excited to do. Sometimes we get a twisted where we think, oh, if I find my passion that I'm gonna get rich doing it, I'm gonna be so successful and get all this acclaim, which is all possible. But the better question is, what are you willing to do to make this your profession yeah. or your vocation or to make it sustaining, sustaining for you, right? And a lot of times that journey is not sexy. You know, I, I, I know you've had this in your journey, but I've had a time in my life where I was making zero money uh, I was living, you know, in a friend's extra bedroom on a bunk bed, not knowing, you know, how am I going to like eat, let alone save money for retirement or buy a car, all these things. But um, I think it is a really important question that sometimes we try to ignore. But if we have the privilege, and I actually think it is a privilege to be able to ask ourselves that question because not everyone is frankly in the position to be able to do so. But if you're able to, it's, it's a really worthwhile question to consider. Well, let's pause that conversation. We've arrived. Um, All right. So basically, this podcast consists of like arriving and having a bit of an interactive experience at an NGO. So uh, we're heading. It. We're heading in now to. Um, it's actually a. It's actually. Infinite flow, which is this like, dance, uh, dance group. Okay. Yeah. So I, I wasn't going to warn you, but I think this is going to be kind of fun. Today we're visiting Marissa Hamamoto. Marissa is a leader, artist, speaker, and founder of Infinite Flow. Infinite Flow aims to empower people through dance and storytelling. Having survived a stroke, multiple sexual assaults, body shaming, PTSD, and discrimination as an Asian American, Marissa developed deep empathy towards those who are excluded. This eventually led her to start Infinite Flow in 2015, which has become an award-winning Los Angeles-based nonprofit and professional dance company that employs dancers with and without disabilities. Her mission is to use dance as a catalyst to dismantle biases and promote inclusion in greater society. 61 million adults in the United States live with a disability. One in four adults in the United States have some type of disability. These come with various barriers that may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Disability inclusion is still a huge issue that we need to address. Many people experiencing a disability in the United States believe the Americans with Disabilities Act needs a recalibration as it currently only offers minimum support and has barely any official enforcement. Inclusive private organisations and initiatives are also key and Marissa is truly leading the way with what she is modelling with Infinite Flow. Okay. 
I'm very nervous, actually. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. because I have no idea. This is Marissa. You founded an organization, Infinite Flow. Correct. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us briefly just a bit about what your vision is, what you're doing? And sure. then you can jump in and meet your friends. And sure. Um, so Infinite Flow is a nonprofit based here in Los Angeles. We are a professional dance company composed of dancers with and without disabilities. And our mission is to use dance to promote inclusion and celebrate intersectionality. And these are my actually founding members, Mia Shaikowitz <laughs> and Lourdes. And probably the best activity to get to know us to actually dance. Yeah. All right, let's do it. So, <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we'll, we'll do like a quick warm up, and this will be just more like just follow, just follow me, you know, if you face the mirror, super cool. And then we're gonna do a little bit of partner work. Oh, you're feeling it. I like it. I'm feeling it. This is like a uh, body popping, right? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of partner work and this is like I mean wheelchair dance is not the only thing we do at Infinite Flow today I have my two wheelchair dancers but we have dancers who are deaf blind uh, with different intellectual disabilities neurodivergent neuro, uh, neurodivergent dancers etc so we have so it's a mix of people but how, how did it all begin what was your initial like what started this whole journey yeah so I'm a stroke survivor so the short story is, I had a stroke when I was in college, and that led me to this work. The longer story, <laughs> which I think we should get after the dancing. Is, okay, yeah, we can do it. Yeah, the yeah, is um, it's a lot of it actually has to do with my Asian American heritage of feeling like the other, like mm. I grew up in, very similar to you. I kind of I didn't grow up in all, like in, in the in um in Kansas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I grew up here in Southern California, but I grew up like in a very predominantly white neighborhood. So I was one of the only people of color. And uh, between that and um, there's just been so many instances in my life where I felt like the other, like whether I was the only Asian American or when I went to Japan. And even though I'm Japanese, I'm still not Japanese enough in Japan. Um, and I mean, I can go on and on, but I just always felt like I never belonged. So. In so you a way. wanted to create a space where people felt like they could belong. Yeah, and not just not just this space, but a, like a company that inspires the world to create a culture of belonging is how I would like to kind of describe what we do now. But let's get dancing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love. Yeah, I, I love end up talking. Okay. Okay. So you're ready to go, and then step in. Go ahead, and quick, quick, slow. We're dancing. Quick, quick, oh. slow. Say say the words with me. Quick, slow. Uh -huh. Quick, quick, yes. slow. Yeah. I'm a dancer. Yes. And maybe you can dive in a bit deeper, like this whole feeling of wanting to um, model what like an inclusive future could look like, right? Yes, yes. Like uh, recently, um, someone asked me this question. I started crying because all I see is like, like a sea of people of all all colors, all races, all ages, all sizes, all abilities, um, all gender identities, sexual orientation. So, like just everyone just dancing together as one. That's like the vision I have. Um, but I just feel like, like even right now, we didn't know each other, but just in a 10 minute dance class, it's like, we're comfortable with each other. And that's, and that's, that's, what, that's the magic of dance. It's like, yeah. it's like, we don't have to go through like this two hour conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can connect with people that we don't know through just a, five minute dance, 10 minute dance, like, you know, right? Like that, and that's the beauty of dance. And, and whether you're in doing the dance itself or you're watching, like the, there's like this similar effect of feeling like that, oh, 
oh, like, you know, we, when, every time I show the sizzle reel, like, what I get is, like, like this sense of, like, oh, everyone can dance, and therefore I belong to, you know, so. And, and you know, Mia's right now talking about wheelchair disability, but this is not just disabil for disability, this is for race, this is for, like, sexual orientation. I mean, I had this dream once, and when it's President Obama and and um, Trump had a dance together. <laughs> and I mean, as cheesy and wow. corny and- That would go viral. Yeah, yeah, but like, if you think about it, like what if like they're, they're, they're you know, they, they like, let's say their wives and then like switch partners and they dance with, I mean, I don't know, but like, I'm just wondering if there would be any like aha moments in that, but it's, it's like, it's kind of like that. It, it, it's not dance, and it, we're do, we have a focus in disability inclusion, but intersectionality is kind of like where it's right. heading. We focus on the um, common. The common yeah. is, is that we can all dance. Exactly. So that's, that's the focus. Once you focus on that, everything mm. else mm -hmm. is secondary. And that's mm. just part of who you are. It's just like when you see someone on the street, you're like, okay, they may be different. Of course, they're going to be different from you. We all have different fingerprints for a reason. We're different. But once you start talking to them, you realize, wait, we're human beings. We're, right. We have something in common. Let's focus on that. And the rest is just getting to know the person better. <laughs> but dance can be that yeah. first, that first yeah. introduction. Well, thanks for sharing. I feel like we're out of time, but um, where can people find out more? Like, what's your website and Instagram and stuff like that? Uh, you can find us at, at Infinite Flow Dance. Um, if you want to tag me, we're at Marissa Hamamoto, uh, infiniteflowdance.org. Sorry, I almost forgot our website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thanks for having us today. Thanks for giving us this amazing experience. and and I'm excited when you guys do your next big event and I'd love to come along and we will be there. Be a part of it. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having us. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you. yay! Awesome you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Obviously that was a bit of a different experience. Like, that was cool. That what was is doing and super fun. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you for introducing me to them. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really cool what you're saying about like seeing, it's kind of what we were talking about on the way here, it was. seeing this prejudice division happening. Um, but then she's like, how do we paint a picture of what the future could look like where we, we are fully inclusive and we live in a society where we are yeah. metaphorically all dancing together, you know, yeah. or, or at, you know, literally dancing together. Um, I'd love to get a bit more personal as well sure. I know you've recently got married we did I watched your video with her where you it was like both sides yes and something that really intrigued me was that her father wasn't didn't approve initially he did not and I don't know why but I just wanted to ask you about it because it's like that would be like devastating for any guy looking to marry a girl to not have the father's approval when i first kind of met him he was like really cordial to me it was fine but it was actually when we were getting really serious and i knew that i wanted to ask for her hand i wanted to do it in a way that was really traditional and like you know get the blessing respecting the pair of course yeah. and he said no and i was shocked and the reason i was shocked honestly is because and this is not to toot my own horn but i've always been the kid whether it's at church or friends parents know me I've always been the kid that everyone's parents really like. Where they're like, oh, you should hang out more with Jason. He's like a good kid. Or a girl. So you'd be the winning. You'd yeah, be like the winning I've never guy. had an issue. Like, that is my core demographic, you know? <laughs> you and can win over the parents. I've always felt that. Even if, like, the daughter wouldn't like me, the parents would like me, right? Yeah. But with him, he was just, like, against it. And I, like, really deliberately asked, like, in Korean, practicing everything. And he said, no. And I said, oh my God, what? he goes, no. If you were gonna ask me, you should have like worn a suit and you should have like pulled out all the stops. Wow. So not only did he say no, later that day, we ended up going uh, to the wedding together and he was driving us to the wedding, similar to this. And I knew by this point, he was like super formal, right? Yeah. And on my way down to the hotel reception to, to leave with him, when I sat down, you know, we're supposed to meet at, let's say, 5 o'clock. I sat down at, like, 4.55. I look at my suit, and I have, like, a tiny little hole right at the seam of my pants. Oh, no. And I'm freaking the F out because I'm like, dude, this guy's going to see this. 
He's going to flip out and be like, you're not good enough for my daughter. So I run to the front desk. I ask him if they have a sewing kit. Lo and behold, they do. So you're sewing your pants. So I run to my room. I'm sewing my pants. And then I get a call to my room. It's like 503. And they're like, where are you? And I'm like, shit, I'm late. Oh, now, now you've been disrespectful. You're yes. late. <laughs> so I run down. I get in the car. He goes, why were you late? I'm, I'm making, I made up an excuse. I said, oh, sorry. I couldn't find my gift or my card. He goes, that's unacceptable. Get out of my car. And I'm shocked. He and goes, you're like less than five minutes late. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, within five minutes. And oh, he said, that's so God. disrespectful. Why would you be late? And I'm like, so then I you said. You should have just been on it. So then I was honest. I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. I was early, but I had a hole in my pants. And I went to sew it up. And then um, he was pissed still, but he said, all right, fine. So we're on our way to the wedding. And we're on our way to the wedding. He's driving. My mother-in-law, my future mother-in-law is in the back seat. And I'm sitting here giving him directions. Super awkward. And he's like progressively getting more and more angry. And he's like, I was so disrespectful. That shows me your character, that you're not a responsible person, that you're not going to take care of my daughter. I don't like Whoa. this. I don't like you for my family. And my family, this is unacceptable. And he kept on saying this. And I was like shocked. And I was like so hurt. That he, you know, and I was embarrassed too because I was like, dude, I was late, but I felt like there was a good reason for it. And he kept on saying it to the point that I said, I said really respectfully, I said respectfully, and I said this in Korean, but respectfully, I, I'm so sorry I'm late, but in my family, like, we wouldn't talk to each other this way. Yeah. You know? And as soon as I said that, we were on the highway, he pulled over, he said, get out of my car, and he kicked me out of his car, and he left me on the side of the highway, and he drove off. Oh my gosh. And was your my girlfriend My girlfriend was or? at the wedding. Oh, okay. Because I was so like, she's is not she in not the intervening? Room. I'm like, no, is she she's not, not like, there. She has no idea. Dad, shut up. Like, and she would have. Um, but I'm like on the side of the highway and literally I think to myself. Did you cry? I was crying. Oh, yeah. I would oh, be crying I'm for I'm falling sure. because I'm like, I've ruined it. You I, thought that might be it, like uh, she... Oh, yeah, because I thought, oh, my God, if I don't get her... Now. Yeah, and I know that their family is so close. I was like, oh, if he doesn't... And I don't want to be in a family where I don't want... You know, the father doesn't love me or at least accept me. And this so was I'm all crying. last year this was happening? This was a year and a half ago. Wow. And I was like, I've messed this up. I've ruined it. I should have just kept my mouth shut, all that stuff. Um, I Uber. I ended up getting an Uber to the wedding. All of that, we, I talked to Mel and she, she's, she supported me because she's like, I understand, my, my father can be a really difficult person at times, right? And that became a whole thing that we had to like talk about. It was like, what is our family going to look like? If you and I, you know, if we're going to get married, is this, what are our values? What if, how are we going to interact with your father, et cetera? And what does like honor and respect look like totally. in, in practical? Does it, you know? Totally. Because like you were saying, you'd never speak to your family like that. So right. Like... And I'm afraid now that like my family is going to look like that, right? And I talked a lot with my parents. And, you know, at the end of the day, I said, I love Mel. And uh, it was such a good litmus test for me of like, am I willing to fight? Like the big, big, big boss yeah. for Mel, right? And I asked her mother and I said, I, I love Mel. I love your daughter. I'd love to marry her. And she said, you know what? You got you to gotta go for it then. So I said, okay, I think I've got the blessing. And she, and she said, you know what you should do? You should reach out and send an email to her father. So the night before I proposed, I actually sent an email to her father that was not like, can I have permission? I said, I'm planning on proposing and I would love your blessing and I would love to be part of this family, right? And I proposed and Mel said yes and it was this beautiful thing and actually we called her dad right after. And we called her dad, it was such an interesting thing that happened where he got on the phone, he was so happy for her, his daughter. Huh. And he, he said to me, Jason, um, I'm sorry. This was just, I just wanted to protect my daughter and I wanted to make sure that she married someone who was great. Mm. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, okay, this is great. And it's so funny because in the years since, you know, we're now obviously married, we, we have a great, relationship where it's not we're not best friends and you know it's not it doesn't look like that but i think we have a, like a mutual respect yeah and um i think i understand that for him it's like he was trying to do what he thought was best for his daughter 
And I think that sometimes the father's love just manifests in very different ways. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's how we ended up. And now I'm happy to share like our families are great and you know, we speak to him once a week and all that stuff. Well, <laughs> thanks for opening up about that. Like yeah. that honestly that's is an incredible story. story. If there's a final thought that you could leave people with that are listening or watching, what, what do you think that would be? Like, I don't know, some life advice or just a, a challenge or something to provoke people? What, what would you leave them with? <sighs> that's a good question. Putting you on the spot. No, that's a good one. There's so many things I would say. Um, I think the thing I would say is this. I think that despite all of our differences, we have far more in common than we might think and that it's finding the similarities and the differences that we have is actually what makes for a much more kind of fulfilling, richer community and experience. And even though sometimes that feels uncomfortable that I would lean into that discomfort, seek discomfort, right? Yeah. That I would lean into even fear and failure because that often means that there's something much, much more powerful, much more um, rewarding on the other side of that journey. So. To anyone who's kind of struggling or feeling like they're like they don't have the direction or they feel like they're not doing a good enough job, I would just say know that a lot of times that, that means that the work is being done right now. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank well, you, brother. Thanks for coming. I appreciate on. you, man. And uh, yeah. Of course. Go and check out Jubilee's channel and everything you're yes. up to. Please like, subscribe, and we will see you soon. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Jubilee and Infinite Flow. If you enjoyed this video, please go and subscribe to my new podcast channel and check out the full length podcast here. There's lots of amazing guests and exciting episodes coming soon.